Hey guys, welcome to Irish Medieval History. And this week, I'm going slightly off course this week and back up to Scotland, although my previous um, video was on the Dalrida and the uh, Scotland and the Vikings. So uh, we're, we're kind of in that kind of taste right now of Scotland and Vikings. So I think I'll uh, add a bit more with more Pictish clothing and stuff. So today we'll do a little bit of a talk on Scoto Picto Scandinavian clothing with Hamish here. We'll basically be going through all the stuff of clothing and weapons and so on and so forth. So it's really a podcast I've been really looking forward to because Hamish really specializes in the area, especially with Pictish clothing and stuff. So hopefully you guys really enjoy it. I bet you all will. Anyway, Hamish, do you want to take over and show us where we're going? All right. So, we're, yeah, we're going to kind of dive in as well. Um hmm. Because when we're talking about the, the, the picks in Scotland in particular, we're talking about different time periods as well. And when we mm. fit that in with Viking Age, we're fitting in different types of Pictish cultures with the Viking early Viking Age. Mm. And that's going to blend with Irish, Saxon, Northumbrian. It's this whole melting pot of what we tend to call insular in the British Isles. Yeah. So we're going to kind of go through that in what the the kind of cultures are building and kind of how they change through that time as well mm. and then that reflects how they look through those time periods yeah 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 and it's it's the 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 always most important thing for me to push out there first is what they don't look like <laughs> so, <laughs> yes you know it, it's that's kind of, uh, yeah <laughs> because a, a lot of questions i get people always ask me okay so what's the difference between the gaelic and the hibern of scandinavians and i'm always like what there's not that much of a difference, but they don't look like Celts for one, because people always have the image that the Celts, the Celts, are the ones running around um, with just pants on, naked, running directly at the enemy, and the Vikings are the ones with the chainmail, which is a good start, and then the horned helmet going in there. So it's kind of like I have to break up that whole idea and stuff, especially when I'm doing living history and stuff. So yeah, I agree with you. It is, it's, it's more blurry than people think in reality, I assume. Yeah, with the, with the Picts, we have this this barbarian image and maybe the Irish as well, but specifically yeah. the Picts, the naked, blue painted barbarians. We've got these images that were painted in the 16th century hmm. of these kind of naked warriors with like Middle Eastern weaponry, all tattooed and images that have nothing to do with Pictland. And mm -hmm. people have just run with this. And it, yeah. I mean... I was watching a TV show last night that had all these images in and I was just screaming at the telly. So I always like to point out that that is just this this propaganda. And what we want to delve into is the archaeological evidence mm. and the literary evidence and, and see, yeah. build up a context of really what, what they were like and how close the cultures were as well. Mm. So for, for the Picts, that really starts early on. That starts in the Iron Age. Mm. Um, that's what a lot of people don't realise when you're talking about Picts. You, you're kind of talking about kind of fourth century so yeah around mm. around 300 AD is when they start getting mentioned by the Romans oh. um, and this is what I tend to call kind of proto-Picts they're not really the Pictish culture yet but they're the early Caledonian tribes which are going to form the Picts okay. but they this is where they get their name this is where the Romans start calling them the Picti mm. so when people talk about the Picts they go straight to the early Picti and the Romano era which is important because this is uh you know they have this early Iron Age uh clothing style which we see throughout the British Isles and it is being influenced by the Romans mm. so a lot of the the, the stuff we type seeing carved figurines and bits of clothing it's kind of the same between the Romans and, and the natives and one of the biggest imports from the Roman Empire at the time from the British Isles was of a type of hooded cloak mm. and ah. it's the type of stone carvings as well and yeah. we we find uh, the Orkney hood which I'll talk a bit about later mm. um, is very similar so we're, we're looking at already a bit of a blend through the Iron Age styles from the Romano kind of era. Mm. Um, and this would have been quite similar across the British Isles. Yeah. It, it, that's very fascinating because I did notice that coming into around 410, especially in Ireland and stuff, you start to see the cloak with the brooches and stuff. And I was looking at Romo Britain kit as well, and they have the cloak with the brooch. And I was like, wait, there's a lot of similarities between the... Um, Irish and the Romano Britons at the time as well. So that's very fascinating that we see the same blur happening in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we have evidence of the, the Romans using auxiliaries from another 
confirmation, mm. probably like France, and, and seeding them throughout Pickland as spies. Mm. And then these these spies then went native and turned against the Romans and set traps for them. So nice. already you're these these conquered tribes with their own clothing having then been influenced by the Romans and then seeded into these cultures. And you just see this whole this whole mix of, of clothing style there, basically. Mm. So we'd see a lot of that crossing over. But what, what we really see is through the Roman oppression, the tribes start to come together. They start to amalgamate, form this Pictish nation. And by 410, Romans are leaving. Mm. And there's that century, that fifth century is that that real melting pot in the in the entire British Isles where all these cultures suddenly don't have this oppressor. So they start flourishing in their own styles. Mm. So Pictland starts to really shore up its border. Dalreda started to strengthen mm. and, and form a kingdom. The Northumbrians are really pushing and creating this kingdom. So all these cultures are setting up their borders and within those borders, they're flourishing their art styles. This is where we start to see this huge influx of all the native jewelry and clothing. So you'd see all this weaving and casting going on. And although the clothing's going to stay mostly the same, it's the jewelry that really sets these cultures apart. Mm. And that's the artifacts that we really like to look at. And generally because in Scotland we have so few clothing artifacts, almost nothing for that period. Yeah, <laughs> the same in Ireland. Um, I, don't, I don't think anything survives. Um, someone will probably correct me later, but we have that one thing. And I'm like, no, I don't think, no, I don't think <laughs> anything survives the entire early medical period which is such a tease. The only thing we're working with is um, carved sculptures, like the cross in um, Clan McNoy's and a few other carvings all over the country. And we have the Book of Kells. But other than that, we have nothing to work with. And people always write to me and send me comments going, OK, I'm looking to put together a Hibernian Scandinavian kit. And I'm just like, well, we have this one picture in the Book of Kells, and then we have a few sculpture images. <laughs> take your pick <laughs> yeah and at, at least it kind of is the same where you have the quarter length pants and then you have the cloak over and then you ha may have riveted nail and stuff and you might have a nasal helmet to work with but that's really it like you really don't have much but at least there's a little bit of you know the same stuff popping up a little bit over in um ireland yeah we're, we're seeing very similar here and th this is that from going the fifth century onwards is where we start to see looking at clothing in Scotland through this Pictish era that is going to combine the kind of early stuff and it's going to combine the Viking age. I tend to look at sixth to ninth century. Mm. That's that melting pot. That's tend to be our focus of artifacts because there's so few, they spread between that period. So we have to kind of chuck it in together. Um, and then as, as a craftsman with a, um, not coming from an academic point of view, I find it's it's really important to combine the academic view of things and the craft mm. view of things. So it's looking at the academic papers, reading excavation reports, finding the artifacts, going to the museum, replicating them, and then using them. And that's how we learn what works, what doesn't work, and what actually fits together in the right context. Mm. Um, so to kind of start off that, yeah, looking, interpreting, because it's all about interpretation. We don't know. It's just our interpretation. Mm. We have this collection of artifacts which i'll dig dig a few replicas out to show off and then <laughs> looking at book of kells and any other kind of um literature sources we have mm. and it's interpreting a kind of um context from that and then we found by going out and using it in the landscape on the hill forts that it was worn that's how we can learn kind mm. of more um so i'm going to start off with shoes nice shoes as, as a leather worker, shoes are always going to be a pretty big thing for me. I actually um, had a um, this man in Ireland, he, his name now has gone completely over my head, but he specialises in shoes. And he said he would always judge a reenactor firstly on their shoes first. And I kind of stuck with that since because you can always tell if they're a decent one or a bad one by their shoes straight away. Like So I think that's a good start. <laughs> I, I don't know what that says about me because I, I I believe I'm wearing a princess's shoes. So, <laughs> so I'm going to grab a shoe here. So when uh, when we're talking about shoes in um, I'm going to say Scotland. I'm talking about Pickland, Dalreda, and and all sorts. Mm -hmm. um, we have basically one artifact in Pickland, and then we have a couple of artifacts in um, what I'd say Dalreda on um, Iona. The Iona excavations were done in the 60s and 70s and they unearthed a couple of shoes. And there was a, an excavation at Dundurn Hillfort, which is right on the edge of Pickland, also in the 70s. Um, 
they weren't looking for really artifacts, so they found the shoe, stuck it in a drawer, and there it remained until I dug it out again to make a replica. Nice. So here a is a lot of stuff. Here ah, is a replica of the shoe. That's um, gorgeous. So it's small to start off with. It's very small. No. Um, it's a Lucas type pattern, which we see in Ireland with this mm. one piece construction with this kind of seam running around the toe. It's got the triangular heel on it, mm. which I've discovered is fantastic when you need to row a ship. Yeah. And it has a decoration on it, which is completely unique in the time period. Nothing oh my else. God. It kind what? of mimics early pottery, this, this lovely stamping. Yeah, it's um, amazing. So completely unique shoe. Um, right. So what I've learned from making this, first off, is that the original was quite smooth on the bottom. Now, the hill fort it was found at um, had uh, wattle flooring within the hill fort. It's mm. quite steep to get up and a lot of farmland around. The person wearing the shoe wasn't scrabbling over rocks. They weren't, <laughs> they weren't on campaign. This is a slipper for prancing around your hill fort and showing yeah. off because it's, it's a high status piece. Yeah. Also tried walking up the hill fort in them and I couldn't get up without them falling off. So I've had to add laces to my own one to tie on boot. So it really is for like a little girl or a princess or any of that, you know, that whole. <laughs> yeah. Quite, quite possibly because it's, it's quite low cut at the front. It does look it, like something you'd wear for comfort around the uh, Cranog or in the Tuat or something. It doesn't look like something that you'd go up and down the mountains with because you, you'd ruin the design, wouldn't you, over time with um, friction and stuff? Yeah, I, I think whoever was wearing this shoe, if they were traveling, they were on horseback. Mm. That would just make sense that if you're high status, you're not coming and going from a hill fort mm. unless you're on a horse. So I'm, I'm looking at it as a high status piece and I'm looking at needing laces on to, to turn it into a boot if I'm doing anything through yeah. the islands, for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm, I, I mean, I've been wearing these. They're super comfortable. They're very practical, but they're mm. over-engineered for the type of shoe and they're not what we see on Iona. Yeah. But this Lucas type pattern is what we see on loads of shoes in Ireland. So Dundurn Hill Fort, it was found on the edge of the empire. Dalraid is the other side of the lock. It's Loch Arn, Loch the Irish. Hmm. Possibly that's trade coming through already. So we're seeing yeah. trade coming through from the leather workers, possibly. Um, and then there's the type of shoes on Iona that have a very high back on them and a very high tongue here. Hmm. And we see this on the stone carvings as well. Um, I'm yet to make one of those, but they're possibly horse riding shoes as well. What, what year are you dating that shoe for? This is um, within 6th to 9th century. That's as close as we can. So you're it's saying already, that we already have influence of trade coming in. Is that from our side in Ireland or is that coming in from Scandinavia, do you assume? We don't know. What we, what we do know is when we look at jewellery, like the silver brooches, there's um, the penannulars, there's very specific Pictish ones, very specific Irish ones. Mm -hmm. And then there's some that have combined elements of both wow. or have been adapted to the other. So we have clear evidence that Pictish craftsmen are traveling to Ireland to work and Irish craftsmen are traveling to Pictland to work. That's so exciting in a way for me because I always assume this sudden burst of craftsmen moving around and stuff would happen from 795 upwards. And what you're saying here is that we already see movement going around. This is amazing for me, like, to be honest with you, because I've just kind of had a closed mind. It's when you started saying it, I actually just realized I have a closed minded view on it because I just assumed there was a sudden opening of the world in 795 that, you know, people kind of just stuck to their own, did a wee bit of trading, but that's not, you know, until the long ship comes in, we didn't really see much in the view I had. <laughs> yeah, we, we see this influx of Vikings then as like the uh, the industrialization of trade and, and the slave trade is a big part of it as well. Mm. But the slave trade was well and truly alive yeah. well before then. Yeah. Lots of evidence of Picts and Irish um, slaving each other. And so naturally, if you buy some slaves in Ireland and you find out what they're doing, they realize one is a silversmith. Of course, you're going to have them making some brooches for you. Yeah. So whether it's whether it's under duress or not, we don't know. But it, it, it looks like craftsmen would travel to a local laird and be paid uh, maintenance for staying and working there. So high status craftsmen that gained a reputation would be trading between borders to pick up the highest paycheck by, by the looks of it. Um, so it's very so possible <laughs> shoes and jewellery are all moving around but whichever craftsman is producing it it's the local 
uh, the local laird or whatever is um, is commissioning his own local art style. Mm. So we're seeing the same art styles, but they could be produced by different craftsmen. So that's kind of where we where we start with the shoes. Really, that's that's where we're at. And then um, of course we have all the finds from York and and all, and all the Saxon Viking stuff. Mm. Um, but we we don't really see that style in Scotland. We don't have any evidence for it. I would say. So we, we go from shoes, and I'm going to start with, with leather work because it's my thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we've, we've got shoes, and then the, the next artifact we have is we have Loch Glashen Cranach in Dalreda. Now, it's mm. not far from um, from the main um, kind of power centre in Dalreda, um, Donad. Loch Glashen's a stone's throw away, really. Mm. Now, at, at the clinic, they, they found evidence of um, brooches, and they found uh, the remains of a leather bag, which I have a replica of here. Um, so I, I show these off as Pictish and Kit all the time, but really I try and say it is from Dalreda, this beautiful leather satchel. That is amazing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, whether they were Bible bags or to me a bag is a bag, we don't yeah. know, but it's nice to have a solid find that we can really work with. Mm. And we see evidence of bags being carried in Pictish stone carvings as well. Um, and there is bag finds from Ireland, like some stunning yeah. ones with all the building decoration. I was, actually, um, I was actually in a, I was in the Battle of Hastings and my wife had the find from Ireland and somebody actually turned around and said it was a fantasy find. And why, why me and my wife were just like, what? <laughs> we literally had to correct the person there and then that it was a find from a monk to hold books in. Um, yeah. Your man just... <sighs> Sometimes, but yeah, they seem to forget that uh, even within the reenactment world, they think we're the ones who are the savages. Like, so yeah, seeing that stuff always really excites me, especially that one there because it looks so fancy and nice. I'd love to bring that home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah. So we're bet between kind of leather finds. We're kind of stuck between. We have a bag from Dalreda, a shoe from Pickland, maybe a shoe from Dalreda. Mm. That's kind of it. We have we have very very plain iron buckles that that point towards um belts and things and then another another thing i really like to show off which you'll love this and um, this is this is from ireland oh yes so this is the the concluse flacket um which i've had a crack at um so yeah when carrying carrying anything like water mead um you're most likely going to use leather up until mm. 200 years ago leather was used for all of these things yeah um now the original um in the national museum of ireland is about three or four times bigger than this <laughs> so i'm thinking to hang on the side of a horse to carry large that makes exactly for, a lot more sense but i've just scaled it down and scaled the kind of designs down ever so slightly mm. um but we have evidence in the vitae of saint columba of him performing a miracle with a leather flask where it's empty he puts it in the sea and when he brings it out it's full of milk mm. so i love seeing reenactors all walking around with their mead flasks and i think no 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 Milky boys, <laughs> you, you carry a milk in your flask. <laughs> mm. So yeah, when when we're looking at leather finds, we're looking at really decorated pieces. Mm. I mean, this is this is thought to be kind of um, ninth, tenth century. So it's classed as a Berno Norse. Whether it was a, a native Irishman that made it or a Norse craftsman, we don't know. But it's probably that blending of styles. Yeah native craft it's it, it's insanely blurry i was even i'm actually doing the viking age timeline for my youtube channel right now and straight away when turgus comes in it, he turgus everyone thinks that turgus is like completely independent when in fact when i analyzing it he's more or less rebelling against the um king in ireland at the time and he's kind of like the head poncho but he's still playing the kind of irish he, he's still playing the culture ball he's playing with the rules that's in ireland and stuff which shows that he's somewhat already simulated into ireland and in around oh god is he 840 around 840 anyway that to show that the hibernian scandinavians are already playing ball with the rest of the gaelic so early on it's just like okay things are way more blurry than what we assumed at the start like and that's even before uh broad air uh mac Imer takes over in about 870 and he goes 100% native. He starts fostering his children into the uh, Northern Nail. The Northern Nail foster their children over to him. Um, and they go completely native. And that's where it gets insanely blurry from that point, point onwards. And it's just so funny that you say that because everyone has that assumption that it's Viking versus Irish. And yeah, it, it's insanely blurry. Like, And 
to be honest with you, I prefer it that way because it gives it more of that kind of war band feeling of the war bands against a neural war band, clan versus clan, instead of this, uh, you know, the that narrative of my race against your race. That makes no sense to me, to be quite honest with you, from our early med- medieval perspective. Yeah, absolutely. We we see we see culture clashes like this all the time. Yeah. Um, still going on right now th- this week. <laughs> yeah. <you know>? yeah. <laughs> so we that's why we like to kind of point out that a lot of our finds, um, you know, we're saying Pictish here, but what we really mean is is insular. You mm. know, it's a blend of Pictish, Dalreda, Northumbrian, they all kind of put together. Mm. And the, the clothing, the clothing is mostly the same. We see some slight kind of differences. So we see uh, across uh, Ireland and Dalreda and Pictland, as you say, that kind of, yeah, the, the short trues, because we, we live in environments that you're going to be wet to up until your knees all day. So yeah, you may as well clothes there. Yeah, because I did, my assumption is that it's uh, for martial art purposes, because uh, I, I'm not sure about Scotland, but in Ireland, it's a lot of cattle raiding and it revolves young fellas between the ages of 14 to 25, going up there and being young fellas. Um, one war band of young fellas up against another war band of young fellas and probably just lining up in groups, you know, one fellow dueling another fellow. And I've already tried dueling in those shoes. And unless you get the spikes, and the problem with spikes is your foot stuck in and stuff. I always found it was better to go barefoot to try to do any form of martial arts because a lot of martial arts, I'm here over here now in Japan doing a good few other martial arts and stuff. And it's very much, you have to use your feet to dig into the ground and stuff. So even here in Okinawa where the terrain is rough and stuff, a lot of the time you're actually better off going barefoot. And so I assume in Ireland, they're going barefoot. And we can actually see images in the 1500s of Kerns going barefoot. And the people may, people automatically assume, oh, it's because they're savages. And after doing a lot of martial arts, I now I'm looking at it going, no, they're trying to grip the ground with their feet so they're not slipping when they're trying to do martial arts. So that's 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 the way I'm viewing it. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but that's the way I'm looking oh, at it. I anyway. agree with you. I think, hmm. I think there's an element of that. I think the practicality, you're going to be wet all day. You need grip. You're walking around. You, do, you tend to not need shoes. Yeah. And if you are wearing shoes, um, the biggest question I get when I'm, when I'm talking about shoes is, do they keep your feet dry? The answer is no. Yeah. And they're not supposed this this whole uh, keeping feet dry in boots is a whole modern concept mm. um the reason they wouldn't keep your feet dry is often shoes were rawhide you would cut the hide cut it into a shape wrap it around your foot and you'd soak it to put it on and then go mm. and it's just sharp stones so, so yeah wet feet is a given with these shoes so that that's that's totally thrown that but the thing is they'll dry really quick and mm. stuff in your shoes with wool or grass will be warm and dry um, but if you're doing anything practical, if you're working in the fields or the forest or you're fighting, you're probably not going to have shoes. Yeah. You just need shoes for, you know, when you're when you're on the road mm. on sharp rocks and things, if you yeah. can afford shoes. But generally, yeah, you're going to have you're going to have shorts down to your knees mm. and, and be the rest of the leg. And then we one thing that we keep coming across is we, we have evidence in Scandinavia and, and with Saxons of the these leg wraps that everybody loves. Hmm. Um, and of course in earlier periods in, in the rest of um, Europe we've got different types of leg wraps some are just one strip of fabric wrapped around and tied hmm. we have the leg bindings we see a lot and then we have some evidence in Scandinavia of hose where it's basically like large socks you tie up onto your hip hmm. no evidence for these in Scotland, Dalreda, Pictland or Ireland hmm. but that, which is strange we have no evidence but we have almost no clothing finds but mm. we still interpret that it's a practical piece of clothing that would have been used because shorts down to your knee, very practical through the day. When you need to warm up, you just wrap something up to that. So yeah, whether it's hose or leg wraps, we, we tend to say it's a fair interpretation to assume that the, the Celtic folk would have seen these and, and adapted them as well, even though we mm. don't have fun. Um, so I think if anybody's looking at their kit and wondering whether it's fair or not, I think it's mm. a fair interpretation to go with. It's not a large leap. Yeah, but yeah, people do tend to try and differentiate by well, one thing with like Pictish and Irish kit. Sometimes for it to stand out, you want it to just look not Viking. That's what a lot of people want to yeah. do because it's, if you put those leg bindings on, people go, ah, that's Viking kit. Yeah, I've even gone as uh, sometimes I have to go as bad as having tartan on. Look, I'm Irish, just tartan on. Look, I'm Gaelic, yeah. I'm not Viking. 
So I, I like to use the tartan trick here and there, like, and then you've got yeah. some people who are like, oh, they didn't have tartan back then. I'm like, there's tartan that like goes before the early medieval period. So <laughs> yeah, we have we have the we have Czech fabric. So we've got um, a small scrap in Scotland from Falkirk called the Falkirk fragment, mm. um, which is a beautiful little little Czech fragment. Um, so we know they had Czech. Um, there's also very similar finds in Norway and, and also the museum. There's an yeah. almost identical piece. Um, and we know they had herringbone weave from the Orkney hood. We also have a find which I discovered recently in a research paper from 1900s. Small find of um, diamond twill, which seems to have been lost in the archives, but there is evidence of diamond twill as well. So we have all the similar weaving styles from the other contemporary cultures. So they were wearing check, they were wearing herringbone, they were wearing diamond twill, just like the Irish, just like the Saxons, just like the Vikings. Mm. So this is where so the fabrics were all the same. They were all being traded the same. Clothing styles that differ would probably be the shorts mm. that we see the most, which kind of people use to identify Irish or Scots. Mm. Um, when you look at the Book of Kells style, it's, it's very mm. obvious. Um, like with the Hiberno Scandinavians, we do know they had quarter length pants because of the cross in Clamac Noise, which shows mm. two um, Ustmen or Irish Vikings, whatever you want to call them, um, on Clamac Noise killing a priest. And they have quarter lamp pants, but at that point they're being called Gaul Gale in the Book of Annals. So they're kind of already mixed in with us anyway. They're not Norse, um, which I do find really interesting about the annals. Um, if anybody actually wants to read it, I'll actually link it below. But in the annals, it literally, uh, when you're reading secondary sources, they're always like Vikings, Irish. But then when I actually read the annals for myself, they're actually going Gaul Gale, Norsemen, Northmen, and Gale. You know, they're they're actually. The annals actually yeah. separate everyone up. And interesting enough, if they're saying Gaul Gale, that means these are people who are mixing within society. And then obviously you've got them on the Cross of Khan having quarterland pants. So it really highlights that it really is an insular culture going on here in Britain and Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And, and the other items of clothing are mostly the same. Like a, tun a tunic is a tunic at the end of the day. It's not really going to differ. We, we sometimes differ a little bit. We have a, a Pictish stone in, here in Scotland that shows the, from Goldsby, shows the Goldsby man side on. He has a planking axe and a knife. And you can see the seams in his tunic. So we often copy where the seams are. Um, and we're not sure if it's just a seam that finishes in the armpit or if it continues up. We tend to bring it up here. And we say that's the best you're going to get at interpreting a Pictish tunic rather than a Viking tunic. And you're only going to know if you go like this. So it doesn't really matter. A tunic is a tunic. And then the cloaks, yeah, we've got, uh, in, in Pickland, we've got lots of stone carving evidence of long hoods, hooded cloaks, um, rather than the, the wraparound kind of brat. And then in Orkney, of course, we've got um, the, the stunning Orkney hood. Ooh, this, this sexy thing. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is a replica I had made. The, the only difference is I, I asked for the tassels to be short. On the original, they're, they're like over a foot long. Yeah. Uh, it, I just didn't want to look like Pocahontas. It really reminds me of the Gaelic uh, brat, you know, the big massive clothes, yeah. with the uh, fringes of the bomb. I love them as well. Like, I love the Ho Orkney hood, but I also love brats as well, like, and the history behind it. Because it's only very recently in Ireland that people stopped yeah. wearing brats. Um, obviously, most famously, they have the Galway sh um, shawl. And once yeah. again, beautiful fringe cloak. Abs I love yeah. them. Absolutely love them. Like, yeah. And people are asking, you know, uh, you know, is the style with the fringes. When the fringes are a practical thing. They shed water. Mm. The water drips through the fabric into the fringe. And as you move and it flicks, it sheds the water off. Ah. Um, see the same thing in Native American clothing with the leather, with the tassels. That's what it's for. It's to flick the moisture away from you. Yeah. So it, it looks nice, but it's actually really practical. And mm. this is the, the one garment find we have from Scotland. And it's from Orkney as well. Um, so yeah, we, we we see these hoods, and there's a there's a mention in the Irish tale of the in the Dedarga, where they they mention three Pictish men, um, and they they say they have long hooded cloaks. They're wearing all black with spears and shields and swords, and mm. they're very fierce men. And it even describes their hair as long at the front as it is at the back. Um, fantastic description. So we're we're seeing long tunics, these hoods. Mm. And we're seeing that type of war equipment that the other cultures had as well. So when, to build this, this image, you're, you're looking at very similar dressed men in, in tunics, shorts, hoods or cloaks. And then it's that jewellery that's going to set you apart. Mm. And it's the 
type of brooches. So in, in Pickland, we've got these big, thick silver neck chains as the chieftain chains, which are just crazy amounts of silver. And um, we've got the, the, the large, big penangular brooches and we've got these longer, thinner brooches as well. Um, so it's that kind of jewellery style that you, you start to see differentiate and mostly silver in Scotland. And then in Ireland, you're seeing all that gold work, um, which we tend to not have here as well. Um, and that's what's going to set you apart from the Vikings who have all their style of jewellery, especially mm. the, the female jewellery stands out the most, all the tortoiseshell brooches and things that we don't find here. Yeah. So it's 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 always the jewellery. And it's one thing I love that it still holds up today as a reenactor, mm. that I was at a Yorick Viking Festival two years ago in a very crowded church. We're all bumping shoulders and I have my pin in my shoulder. And I noticed every time I bumped shoulders with somebody, we'd look at each other's pins. And you can tell a lot of someone's kind of social standing by their pin. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was. And it was also, it's documented in, in, in Irish laws that it was also your bond. It was um, your, 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 your word, your transaction honor. If you went to a mill to use the mill, you'd hand your brooch over as collateral. Mm. If you didn't break the mill, you'd get your brooch back. And there was mm. even laws for if you, if someone held your brooch slightly longer than they should have, then they had to pay you some money back mm. before they gave it you. I love so, that. Seeing, seeing these types of things like the jewelry, the brooch, that was the most important thing. And that carried on all the way through up until the, the Jacobite era here, because it's still people look at tartans and clans and kilts as being the important thing. But you pay for the colours you could weave and it was your brooch that set you apart. Yeah. And that's always been the thing to draw the eye. Yeah. Um, it's it, funny because I get that as well. Uh, people coming up to me going... Um about uh what's my family color and stuff and i'm like mm, there's actually laws you know stopping you from wearing any of those colors in the period um i actually have a list but i know at the very top it's purple and uh blue purple the one that everyone debates about did it real was it real or not real and then in the middle you've got like the likes of red and browns and so on and so forth and then the very bottom it was white and black and so you're always trying to tell people actually the nobles at the top want to be as colorful as possible in fact you have the battle of tara in 980 where the hiberno scandinavians at this point the hiberno scandinavians are filthy rich after uh, olaf and um they rock up for battle although there's not too many of them at this point because a lot of them got butchered over in britain when they do rock up they're covered in silk and the silk are you know full of all these different colors and stuff and they look like a silk rainbow and it's described by that because I think it was the Ulster Annals really wants to highlight the fact that these men were, you know, dressed up so well with all their silk, the riveted mail, the whole shebang compared to the Irish who were just wearing the bog stand standard stuff, you know, the, all the standard kit like. And although the Irish did win that battle and then eventually pushed out the Eiver, the main Irish Viking family out of Ireland. The thing that the writer wants to take you away is that like this was spectacular. It was the colors that you wanted to go for, not just, you know, two colors. That's what people have that image around. And in fact, you want to try to get in as many colors as possible as you try to get up the ranks and stuff. Yeah, we also see when you when you collate the colors from a lot of the Irish tales, you see purple and blue cloaks tend to be mentioned with a gold brooch. And then brown and grey is often mentioned with, uh, or green with a silver brooch. <coughs> Excuse me. And then kind of like the simple, simpler colours like brown is tend to mention with, with just like a, there's a word for it, they're not sure, but they, they think that's probably just like copper alloy brooch. Mm. So you, you actually see like ranking systems in the colours of the yeah. cloaks with colours of brooches as well. So as you say, you want to move up that colour. Yeah. When I, you see I, a guy walking down in a new colour, you think, oh, well done, you've just moved up in the world. <laughs> Uh, it always does my head in. I always see um, people who don't do any research and they rock around. They're Hiberno Scandinavian and they rock around with the baggy pants and the t they've got like one color on and it's black. They love the black. And then they have a sword and my brain is just like, like <laughs> yeah. what is going yeah. on there? And black is a very interesting one because black is very difficult color to achieve with wool. It's mm. very difficult dyeing fabric black. So we have that mentioned in, in the, the Darga of the three Pictish men wearing all black, which mm. says very much that it's black. Um, and then we have this flip side in, in modern living history where people um, often don't want to buy black leather. And I've had it, a lot of shows people say, oh, they, they wouldn't have had black leather. It's so difficult to do. Black leather is the easiest color to tan. All you need yeah. to do is drop a nail in your tanning and you have black leather. Yeah. So a lot of leather would have been black. 
Mm. But of course, we just don't want it to look like biker studded leather. These yeah, days. there's that as well. <laughs> but be- it's, it's a funny one because if you're playing a peasant in Ireland, see, this is the thing as well, especially when I go international, when I'm over in Denmark and stuff, and lads are like, oh, but, you know, Vikings didn't have black leather and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about Denmark, but in Ireland, black is everywhere. Like all the lower classes have black leather. No, don't get me wrong. I don't think the higher classes want to have black leather. I still think that they want to go for more, more that kind of finer red um, color. Um, that's my assumption. I'm probably wrong, but um, I assume at the bottom is black leather and then people wanted more finer colors from it as they worked up the ranks. But when I was in Denmark and I had somebody correcting me and I was like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm dressed in really basic stuff because I was doing bottles and stuff and I wanted to get trashed. So it was like, I'm just going to wear this uh, black leather. Somebody was like, that's wrong and stuff. And I was like, I don't know about Denmark, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So uh, yeah, when it comes to leather, the the black would, would have been the most common. I mean, a lot of a lot of tanning would have just been done in the bog. So you just throw your hide in the bog, pull it out a year later, and it's tanned, um, and it would be black. Yeah. Yeah. It's from that, that amount of tans in it. So yeah, and then the the red is a bit harder to achieve, but it can be done with native trees like alder can create quite a quite a reddish color. Mm. Um, tends to come down to the barks that you can source. So um, a lot of that depends on trade as well. Mm. We see a lot. of leather in scandinavia a lot of viking stuff and a lot of rus uh, and and yeah a lot of the russian stuff is very very bright vibrant reds so it's doable we don't see the reds there's no evidence for the red in, in scotland we don't have the finds that early um and i don't know so much about ireland coming across the red stuff um i think we do in cork do not take me for my word i think recent finds in cork have one but don't take my word i could have gotten confused with normandy um mm-hmm. The wife is looking at me half crooked. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a red Viking belt find in Cork? Red. Yeah, the wife's an archaeologist. No, she's not. <laughs> Maybe we should follow this up and we'll drop it in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll follow up on it. Um, so we're moving on from belts. <laughs> yeah, so from, from belts. That's that's just kind of covered the the, the leather side of things. The only thing I would say as my own interpretation is um, is more leather clothing. We have very early on that Caesar mentions the native Britons wrapped in, in hide and skins. And there is, um, I believe in the National Museum of Ireland, a leather cloak find. Mm. And then we have on picture stone carvings, kind of crossbow men wearing what looks like the Orkney hoods. And it's been my own interpretation that if you're crouch down in the undergrowth with a crossbow hunting and things will will get shredded by thorns mm. um so it makes more sense to me to have leather over that makes more sense we have one i think it's the fin cycle i have there um the king's men had um leather and it highlights that um which is once again fascinating stuff but i couldn't think of why would they have um leather why why did they have a leather hood on and stuff not leather hood a leather cloak that's what it says and I'm like, okay, why is that? But yeah, the torns, because they're moving through the torns and stuff, that actually makes perfect sense. It's a lot more yeah. smarter, like, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and fishermen have been wearing leather, full leather suits uh, up until kind of um, 100 years ago. So we, we know it's such a practical garment. We just don't really have the finds, but I, I think it's so practical you would have at least a leather cloak or a leather hood as your outer layer. And that keeps all your wool underneath dry and warm as well. Yeah. Um, so would say it's it's more than possible to find to have an image of more more leather clothing as well mm. specifically having the cloak find in ireland and it being mentioned um and then interpreting things like I, i've made a leather orkney hood style to go over my wool one and it works very well so mm. i would expect to see more of that as well really but that that is definitely an interpretation not based on that much evidence yeah we have to highlight that because i i guarantee someone in the comment section will go right I have the bonus kit from the Viking TV show. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can we can just ignore that TV show yeah. for now. <laughs> God, that's only started um, this Friday, so my comment section's full of it. <laughs> gotta be going now. Yeah, uh, I was speaking on an archaeology panel last weekend, and most of the questions were about the TV show. Yes, they're like, very oh, much. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so so yeah clothing wise we got we've got this image of how people are kind of looking and dressed and we've got the, the jewelry and the the fabrics and possibly some leather um so the other thing would be tattoos which is mentioned a lot so when it comes to tattoos it's a bit of a yes or no 50 50 question um and so we we have early mentions from the roman sources we've got sources saying um talking about romans basically walking through a battlefield of dead pics, reading the symbols tattooed on their faces. Mm -hmm. So this points to face tattoos. Uh, the, the fact that it says symbols specifically leads me to kind of think of the symbols we see carved on the stones. Um, there's also a mention of them having animals um, colored up their arms. Um, so, so there's, there is plenty of mentions. There's mentions of them being marked with iron. So, Body paint, very, very possible. Actual tattoos, also very possible. Mm. Um, I believe there's more evidence in Ireland for tattooing, I keep hearing, in high status. Um, I don't know about that well, before the Viking Age. I know during the Viking Age and stuff, I don't think there is. I'll have to see what the reference is for that. Um, just because you have that law of um, St. Patrick and all that stuff where you're not allowed to defile your body. It's more of a Christian view yeah. and stuff. And the Irish going into the Viking Age are, they're blurry with the stuff, but they love the Old Testament stuff. So I always took it as a grain of salt that they wouldn't put tattoos on themselves, especially at the start of the Viking Age because uh, Philmid has taken over and Philmid is a Christian Orthodox nut job. Um, he is starving monks to death because they're not zealous enough and he's really imposing the law of St. Patrick on everyone um, so I can't imagine too many and on top of that as well he's got connections with the Roman um, the church over in Rome he's not a as people would call a Celtic Christian or insular Christian he is Christian Christian he's really strict and he justifies to invade the north of Ireland and unify Ireland out of his complete zealous that he's here to do God's work and stuff. And so I would imagine not too many people are wearing tattoos, but Ireland is funny in the fact that it still has insular Christianity going on all the way up to the, uh, was it the 1500s? So Christianity is really blurry. Even I say 1600s today, you still have four people can't tell where folklore ends and Christianity starts. So it's still in Ireland. It's still very, very blurry especially with the saints, you know, people can't tell which one's a Christian saint and which one's a Celtic saint. Um, I, I still get into arguments. Is St. Bridget a Roman, you know, saint or is she, you know, a Celtic saint? So yeah. it's very blurry in Ireland, you know. I mean, it, it looks in the Book of Kells that a lot of the warriors are tattooed. Mm -hmm. There is definitely red, red pigment in the skin decorating right. them, whether that's just artistic embellishment or not. And then we have the mentions of people being marked with well, iron, which red marks you could be right because in the fin cycle the uh monks who are writing uh fin cycle here um it's mostly written in a very negative light like don't do these things and it's mostly highlighting the fin war band and the christian church is very anti-fin war band and they tell the tales of fin mccool as a real this is not what you're supposed to be in society it's not until the 12th century that fin mccool becomes the king arthur figure in Irish society and stuff. But during the period itself of the Viking Age, although we can't tell if Finn McCool is real or not because they're writing from a past tense again, Finn McCool is seen as a right evil bad guy. He's seen as the villain um, who ambushes and takes people's heads. And they always compare uh, Finn McCool to a kind of more of a pagan deity and that they were more kind of, they, at times they actually refer to the Finn uh, warbands as heathens. Um, so it is quite possible that they were tattooing themselves and the society itself, the Tuits, they were kind of looking at all this as boys will be boys because what happened was that at the age of seven, you went into your fostridge. And then from your fostridge at 14, when you left that, you went into a war band. And then it, you were just sent off to the uh, fringes of society where you fought other war bands. And then when it came down to the fighting seasons, you would have come up, served um, the head of the Tuits and stuff, and then got back into the... Um, fringes of society and that's where you just sold all your wild oaks and stuff it was just the attitude of boys would be boys so i can i can actually imagine them especially called heathens and stuff getting tattoos and stuff but um yeah it's definitely something i'll have to dive into anyway <laughs> yeah yeah the, the tattoos comes up a lot and mostly this this blue tattoo image as well 
don't get me wrong, I, I love my blue tattoos, but um, looking at it historically, the, the mention that of from Caesar about them being tattooed, he uses the word vitras, which was translated as wood. It actually means glass. So people thought he meant blue green glass, but it could have been red glass, it could have been other. And then wood itself is actually caustic. You can't tattoo with wood. Um, it, it's really not healthy for you. So I don't think they're tattooing with wood, if I'm honest. Um, possibly some kind of body paint. Most likely you're looking at black tattoos from, from charcoal and, and tattoos over time do go get bit blue gray anyway. Um, um, yeah. Using kind of iron pigments and, and, and other pigments, you can get red. So you're more looking at red tattoos, red and black is what mm. you're looking at rather than a big blue image, which, you know, I mean, I, I, I love my, my blue stuff just as much, but, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but when we look at this, this wood thing, I don't think it's quite as accurate as we're led to believe. Mm. The other is hair. Um, I get asked hair a lot, so <clears throat> my, I myself have, have fairy locks, dreadlocks, and um, I'm not an advocate for pics or people at the time having dreadlocks. Um, there is Celtic coins from the Iron Age Roman period where they have, looks like dreads, but it, more likely braids, and looking at Pictish stone carvings and the Book of Kells, we have very definite hairstyles. Um, the stone carvings in Pictland are very, very nice kind of cultured hair, quite long, curls, beards, mustaches. Book of Kells has it has a similar. Yeah. I don't think we're looking at dreadlocks at all. Individuals, sure, one or two guys, but not as a fashion. So mm. I always like to point out this this big wild dreadlocks thing. I do not believe it was a fashion between the Picts, Scots, or Irish whatsoever. Mm. Just ignore my hair when I'm in kit. Maybe it was possible in around you know the more ancient periods and stuff when we have more connection with the mediterranean especially when um africa are doing dreadlocks and stuff and it's possible that african traders came up um i know people are arguing now that there was way more contact with ireland and the mediterranean in the earlier ancient periods and stuff just before the rise of the um roman empire and stuff and that the sea people may have been connected to ireland and stuff but that's an argument yeah. i have no idea about Perhaps there were dreadlocks back then. No idea. <laughs> I mean, it, it, if you don't brush your hair, you have dreadlocks. So individuals, sure. <laughs> yeah. but in a culture where rice is life, is, is kind of, is rife, and you have lots of combs. Yeah. Every <laughs> every grave, every site has lots of, this is from a Kranach, with some Kranach. Everyone's got one of these to look after their hair. I, I don't think you're going to have dreadlocks. No. Mm. Um, not when we see so much evidence to the contrary mm. so we're, we're, we're looking at this nice cultured kind of shortish hair um possibly some long hair as well but it's always going to be nice combed hair i believe um nice tailored beards mustaches um yeah we can deduct so much from the book of cows and stone carvings from that so this is this is a far cry image from this tattooed naked barbarians yeah, that started it really is us. This is where we're looking at very fine woven clothes, diamond twill, herring bones and check patterns, very fine colours and rich blues and purples, reds and greens, mm. jewellery of silver and gold, um, and, and possibly skin decorated with tattoos as well. So we've got this like absolutely brimming rich culture mm. um, going on, that, that really big difference. And then the last thing that would come into it would be, would be the weaponry. Um, so one, one of the first things that always jumps out with the picks is crossbows. Yeah. There are three Pictish stone carvings. Um, each of them has a kneeling figure in a hood with a crossbow hunting. Mm. Um, we have evidence of, you know, the Romans had crossbows and we have firing pins and we actually have artifacts from crossbows in Scotland. So that's probably a blend that's come through from the Romans um, with the crossbows. So we know they had crossbows. Mm. Um which you know a lot of people thought they came so much later there's this huge gap where crossbows weren't used at all but it seems they were carried through just don't have a full crossbow find um yeah um it's funny because although i can't find any um crossbows in the earlier parts of the viking age and stuff at the very end of it there's fine there's um not just finds there's finds in cork and stuff of bolts but you also have, and they're mostly used, are they used for hunting? No, they're not used for hunting. It's the arrows are used for hunting. It's in uh, Gerald Wales when the Normans come in. Uh, the Normans come over to try to take over Cork and the Cork Vikings come out with crossbows to fire at the Normans and stuff. So it is interesting that they have crossbows earlier when they were fighting each other or did they? was this from trade with Normandy and stuff? So 
it's interesting. It is very, very interesting. Yeah. And so we, we've got the, the crossbows and, and long range uh, warfare. We'd see the slings, you know, um, native slings. We'd see typical kind of spears and, and bows. Nothing different from what the Vikings had, nothing different from what the Saxons had. The weaponry really blends. Mm. What we do see, um, which is completely unique to the picks, is these small square shields and these H type shields. Yeah. And when you combine that with spears, you can do a lot with them. And and this is what you were saying earlier, the Irish style of small tribes and a couple lads having a go in this dueling culture. Mm. That's exactly what evidence points to uh, in Scotland and Pickland. Mm. We see, you know, spear, this small buckler type shield, and that's, mm. that's dueling. That's not a large scale warfare type thing. Yeah. And the, the, when you have this notch in your shield, this kind of H cut out notch, when you get a spear in that and you can pivot with it and you can do all sorts of maneuvers, um, it vastly changes one-on-one -on -one combat. Mm. Um, we only see these shields on three or four Pictish carvings. Yeah, it, it's very fascinating because I've recently come over to Okinawa and they have bucklers as well, where the rest of Japan is using the samurai sword and stuff. Okinawa has the buckler and spear and they have like a machete kind of sword and straight away it's the terrain. There's a sudden change in terrain in Okinawa. And I notice it's the same thing in Ireland and Scotland with the terrain is very difficult. So people are switching from conventional style shields to more dueling style shields and stuff. And it's so fascinating that that same idea that the, you know, a common human being would have of switching and adapting their martial art to suit the situation is fascinating to me. And this is something the Vikings were renowned at as well, because mm -hmm. we have uh, Viking graves in the North of England where they're buried with their, uh, swords they've brought from home but the belts they're wearing are all manufactured Saxon belts from the same maker so they've gone shopping and all bought mm. belts together but they've all scaled their shields down to the native small bucklers, they've all mm. got small native shields so this is where we see they've come over and they're adapting to the native fighting style, they've ditched their big heavy shields yeah. and they've thought in the terrain, moving around the style of combat let's get these small shields so we're more nimble but they clearly had better swords than us because they kept their swords yeah everyone seems to switch over to the broadsword don't they <laughs> yeah yeah so when it comes to scotland we've got like no sword finds there's 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 lots of uh termed viking swords um they're probably mostly viking some could be insular native finds there is one sword in particular called the gorton sword if anybody wants to look up this um it's found in a context that's not viking at all it's quite inland it's quite away from the sea quite nice decorated sword and it looks the, the pommel and grip looks marginally what you see on the stone carvings so that's the one sword where it's kind of uh, it could be theorized it could be a Pictish sword but it could just as easily be Norse so we can't say one way or another yeah. but if anybody wants to look at native swords in Scotland that's the one you want to research the the Gordon sword it, it, the, the swords are definitely um, a very confusing and complicated one I tried to do a bit on the Ufberg sword and wow, that's a difficult one to find. Uh, and especially when there's so much influences with the Frankish. And it's the same with the sword. The Viking swords found in Waterford are insanely similar to Frankish swords again. So as you were saying before, it's very, very, you know, to try to do any research and stuff in that whole area. Um, I don't know if you've come across um, the, the swords at Lagor Cranach in Ireland. They are fascinating swords. Yeah. These kind of more like a Roman gladius that come out with the, the diamond tip on them. They kind of flare out and then sharpen again. I, I, we don't have any finds of those in Scotland, but they're, they're quite different swords I would see in Ireland. Definitely yeah. these swords. Swords in Ireland are amazing and nobody ever touches them. Like from the Clamac Noise sword all the way into the Ufburg sword that's found, Ireland seems to like to really show off their swords. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Really medieval short swords are absolutely amazing. And it's the same thing going back into the 14 and 1500s. Um, once we've managed to order, you order, you have the Normans that become uh, more Irish than Irish themselves, or you have the Normans that are completely pushed off the island. But once Ireland gets into the Gaelic resurgence and then into the Gaelic Renaissance, the moment that clicks in, we're back to having the Irish ring swords and stuff again. So the Irish really love their swords and stuff, and they love trading in with the Scots. Um, obviously, it's the period you start to see the uh, claimers and stuff start coming into Ireland and stuff. So um, the Irish like weapons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that diverse mix is so rich for to see from Scotland because 
we've got almost nothing in that period. Mm. And, and anything we do on Earth when it comes to stores is, oh, that's another Viking sword. So, yeah, we're looking more at kind of uh, spears and, and axes and things. Um, mm. with, you know, spears with these small shields, that's pretty fair dues for, for the kind of culture we had at the time. Mm. Um, so, you, I mean, combining all these cultures, you take a, an Irishman and a Scot from Dalreda picked and a Viking and stand them next to each other, you're not going to tell all that much difference. Yeah, especially after uh, nine, it was at 870. After 870, it must be very confusing because you have all the fostridge going on. And if you look yeah. at the Orkney sagas and stuff, and it talks about um, the lads at 14 going off, joining war bands, and they're decapitating heads. They're doing exactly what we're doing, collecting heads. Um, it really shows that it is a blur, you know. And to be honest with you, when people get political about it, have Vikings, Scottish and Irish, I kind of just like, eh, whatever, because that's not the point. Um, the thing is, is that these were young fellas between the ages of 14 to 25. And if it looks cool, they were going to pick it up and they were going to do exactly. boys will be boys thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that, I think that that's knocked it on the head, really. Yeah. That you see someone, you want it. And so rather than pulling out a culture, pull out a, an area of geography you want to yes. look at. Where are they? What cultures are around them or, in, you know, incurring into there? And where are you going to draw your influence from? Yeah. If you're you're on the edge of Pickland, yeah, you're looking at the guys across the water in Dalreda and going, ah, man, their shoes are cool. I want some of those. Yeah. I'm going to go kill them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, oh, this, this guy came on the boat from Orkney wearing this hood. Like, oh, it's really cool. I'm going to have me one of those. Yeah. Because, yeah. so, like, don't get me wrong. I, if somebody is doing a Norseman from um, 793 up to 860, I'd say, yeah, I stick to more Norwegian stuff because it's more Northmen. You hear Northmen a lot and there are raiders coming in and stuff. And I know the word Gal, um, Gal Gale is starting to get used in the um, annals, but we don't know. We don't know how much from a scale of Gaelic to Norse, how much they are. But 870 then to 1014, I would say start to mix it up more insular. Uh, because at the, it's that point where the um, Norse in Ireland, the Hibernian Scandinavians, are fostering their children out and vice versa. They're taking in Gaelic children. And furthermore, and I keep highlighting this, their mothers are Irish or Scottish. And that means yeah. that they're being brought up speaking Gaelic. And then they're playing with Gaelic children, which means their first language is Gaelic. And their second language that they learn from their father is Norse. And so they're connected to both the Gaelic world as their foundation and the Norse world as, you know, the big world they can adventure and stuff. And you read Nile Saga, one of my favourite sagas, and you literally have the boys being boys jumping onto boats and they'll go off to Norway. They'll um, obviously it's set in Iceland, um, but they'll come over to Scotland, hang around with the Scots for a bit. And then you have an Icelander who rocks up for the Battle of Clontarf. And people would assume he would join the Viking side, Citric side. Instead, he bumps into Brian Brew, asks Brian Brew, can I join your side? Brian Brew is like, yeah, sure. He joins uh, Brian Brew's side and the Icelander manages to push through. He, he, because so many people are being killed during the shield wall, he helps them push right through and wins the day. And he goes back to Iceland and mounts off about um, his great victory. And nobody turns around and says, oh, but you shouldn't have been fighting with the Irish side. Instead, they're like, oh, you, you know, you led that war band to victory, you know? Yeah, this, this, this is where we see this whole pop of cultures. And I really, in, in this day and age, love to show the multiculturalism of the time as well. Mm -hmm. A ship's crew is a ship's crew. doesn't yeah. matter who makes it up. It just depends who bonds together at the time. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the most important things. It doesn't matter culture, race, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, these are gangs of, of hardy fighting men that mm -hmm. probably all, you know, geographically mix together um, and then pull, pull their own ideas in so yeah. it's very different what we're looking at picking apart these artifacts mm. but there's certain things we can do to make things appear and interpret more uh pictish or dalreda or irish if we want so yeah. like the, the fringe brats the orkney hood that type of stuff you wear that and people start to cotton on okay i can tell they're they're focusing more on this kind of culture but it's still mm. all going to be insular so it's still going to be interconnected mm. Yeah, 100%. You're just pretty much confirming what I was kind of working out, reading the literature and looking at finds and stuff. So thank you so much. Um, do you want to conclude anything before we finish up or are you happy out? I think I think we've kind of said it that, you know, looking at clothing at the time, it's all very finely produced by very skilled craftsmen. It doesn't matter whether you fall on the pagan or Christian. The churches were employing more craftsmen than, than pagan communities were mm. um so you've got this big 
trade influx of craft. Um, you've got all this, this stunning jewellery, clothing, leatherwork, weaponry. It's all mixing and it all depends on where you are at the time and who you're interacting with. So I think the, the multiculturalism is a big thing to, to mm. point out. Um, and that people were mixing, trading and stealing shoes off each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what would you be doing as a young fella? Rob the shoes yeah. up. <laughs> if you're interested in this kind of stuff, read up on it, dive into excavation reports, dive into museums, get the artifacts, get your eyes on, make them, produce them, let's get more out of the world and let's get out there using it, find out what's practical, what works, what fits together. Mm. Um, and just let's start like showing the diversity uh, in clothing of the time period. I think that's quite a beautiful thing. Nice, nice. Um, as always, guys, I will leave all the sources and links below. Um, thanks very much, guys, for coming on board. Um, I guarantee most of you guys will watch to the end because this was an absolutely fascinating topic to cover. Um, definitely my passion. And Hamish, thank you so much. I actually did learn a good bit today. And anytime you want to jump on just for the crack and have a laugh with us, you're more than welcome. Um, I'll probably invite you on for the Christmas special as well again. And um, other than that, guys, thanks very much. Make sure you subscribe below. I'm almost at a thousand views, which means I can start being paid off YouTube, which will be amazing. Um, other than that, guys, thanks very much. And Slan. Bye. <laughs>